Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11. I return, come back to his study, the study of life. And saw under the sun, that is the main theme of this book, everything under the sun, not over the sun, under the sun. <laughs> that the race is not to the swift. Anybody who watches sports, you know, the race car that wins, the race horse that comes in number one, the track runner number one. Solomon looks at life, the race is not to the swift. There are some people who finish their race and they're not doing it quick at all. They're going at a steady, proper, diligent pace. Matter of fact, those who go into life and do something full force, they die out. I have known Christians, gotten saved, got on fire with the Lord, and they fizzled out. I've seen Christians go off to seminary, seminary, as I said it correctly. Man, they love the Lord, King James Bible all the way, come out of seminary, no more King James, no more on fire, teaching false doctrine. God does not want us to walk our race, run our race. He doesn't want us to go 200 miles per hour. If that's not what he's called us to. If he wants us to walk our race, and he wants us to walk and not crawl or run as far as, you know, a fast pace. It's Finishing the race. Paul says, I have finished I have finished my fight. I finished my course. I fought the good fight. It's finishing. And you can go into your race, your walk for the Lord, and go on fire and die out. That's not proper. That's not how to do. And when you read the, the Pilgrim's Book of uh, Pilgrim's Progress, he's not running. And he goes through his life struggles from, from Calvary all the way to the celestial city. And there are times that, you know what, he's not moving at all. I know the arbor, he, he wasn't supposed to sleep, but he slept. But there, there was, uh, with uh, Hopeful, they come to this, this resting area where there's the leaves of food and there's a the fresh water. And they sleep. Then they get back up, get a little more food, get a little more water, and they sleep. That's the race. Sometimes in our race, we take an exit we're not supposed to take. As long as we go through the finish line, the offer and finish of our faith, Jesus Christ, without cheating, without deceiving, without the works and the ways of the devil in the world, nor the battle to the strong. Now, we're going to read about a battle that it wasn't strong. And it's not always life is the strong. That's not always the case. What do you do when you got a Christian woman? She's old. Widow, children growing up, frail in her ways and medical, and she just keeps on praying, serving the Lord, such as Anna did. I don't think she was too fast. I don't think she was too strong. I mean, the Bible doesn't give her give us the, the how old she was, but it does tell us how long she was married to her husband faithfully. And if you're to think that the battle of a Christian is to the strong, then you're going to eliminate all the aged Christians. Because as you grow in age, you don't get stronger. 
I have been serving the Lord in the public ministry since the early 2000s. My strength and my health and my feet, I'm getting less than stronger every year. I can't do the things I did last year, never mind five or ten years ago. But I still got strength. If I have to, I sit down at the street preaching. I can't stand as long, but I still preach the same gospel which has got strength and power. Whereas there are some people, they're younger, they're healthier than I am, and they go out there with, say this prayer. Come on, one, two, three, let's say this prayer now. That's not strength. That's weakness. That's bending and giving in to the devil in the world. That ain't going to be a reward in glory. That man's got to sit down in the chair and he preaches the gospel and exalts Jesus the way the Bible says. It's doing it proper and doing it right before God without any world and any devil. And if you finish the race like that, you got victory. Any world, any devil, or any self, you got wood, hay, or stubble. And now we'll burn. we're all going to have wood, hay, and stubble. But if your race is in the ways of the devil and the world itself, <coughs> Wood, hay, or stubble. That's not a proper finish. Neither yet bread to the wise. They're unwise. There are fools that get bread. In America, you can get bread every first of the month, every third of the month. The government will give you the fool who's dropped out of school, doesn't have an education, don't want to work. America will give you bread. nor yet riches to men of understanding. There are great men of riches. They don't understand anything. That's going to be Solomon's son coming up, Rehoboam. That guy couldn't understand how to keep a government together in the people. And what Solomon's saying now in this part of the verse we're reading is, you know what? What you think... Life ought to be. It's not. I'm going to say what well, well, I'm, I'm going to say it. Because you think your political party is the answer of all answers. It may not be the answer of all answers. Because you think that your form of government is the author form of all the governments to be of the government. It may not be. Solomon's the king. Solomon's the king of God's people in God's city where God put his name, where God's temple was built, certified by King David, a man after the Lord's heart. And you know what? The kingdom starts going downhill. Nor yet favor to a man of skill. Again, I'm going to speak about America because I live in America. I'm applying for work. And I've got skills that some people don't have. Some people have got body features that I will never have unless I get an operation. I wouldn't get an operation. There are some people who do not have the skills, but they have a certain color of their skin that the government says, you know, you have the right, you have the freedom. Everybody's treated treat equal, but you got to hire this race, you got to hire this minority, and you got to hire this sex. And Christians out there, yeah, America. Solomon says, hey, you know what? It's not what you know, it's not even who you know. It may be a government rule, a government law. All the things you don't think would be are, that are oddball. And life runs by oddball. And even God. Now the preaching is not foolish. The gospel is not foolish. Yet God says for a man to get up and start screaming to people about the salvation of Jesus Christ. That's foolish. 
You wouldn't think that a man gets up with an amplified voice and lifts up Jesus Christ. That would be the way. Last Saturday and many Saturdays. I forever have people come up. Well, if you do it this way. And when I put them on target and put them, they don't do anything at all. And they are foolishly thinking, well, you know, you're just screaming at the people. Yeah, the Bible says that's foolish. But the message I'm preaching is not foolish. My targeted audience is as many as people I can hear and get out the gospel. And I told the man, I said, listen, I deal with people one-on-one. -on -one. I deal with people with gospel tracts. I deal with people with an open Bible. Right now, here on a Saturday morning, where there's a lot of people shopping, I want to reach as many as I can with a big, loud voice. Now, what do you do? I let my light shine. I'm a good person. You're everything that the Bible tells you not. But time and chance happens to all. Give it time. And that chance. Christians don't operate by chance. We operate by the will of God. Sometimes the will of the Satan. Sometimes the will of the, the world. Sometimes our own will. It was by chance that your body has been harmed. You mean by chance that you chose to drink, you chose to smoke, you chose to have adultery, fornicating sex, you, you chose not to serve the, the word of God. That's not chance. You were asking for it. Well, by chance, everything's just been torn down in his life. No, the devil's told God, if you let my hands out to Job, you let me at Job, Job will curse you to your face. God said, okay, but these limitations. Well, how come he's, he's getting those things? Because maybe he's listening to God and doing what God wants, wants to be done, and maybe God's blessing him. Or... How come that person is, I mean, he's doing great. Listen, the book of Job should be read with, with Solomon's writings of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Why is it the, the, the wicked are so great and wonderful? And, and maybe the devil's fooling them. Maybe the devil's giving them the golden chain that Daniel got and the great outfit that Daniel got and trying to allure the man of God, I didn't say Christian, the man of God, for us today, the Christian, may the devil's trying to give you, hey, I'll get you off the path. I'll get you walking somewhere else. And you think you're doing fine and wonderful and great and a great everything. To... Yeah. But you haven't read the lad to see in church age, have you? We're great. We're rich. We're wonderful. We're terrific. God's saying you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. You're not running a race. You're running a race for the devil. And you don't even know it. But you're just chucking along. You're going too quick to get too many numbers and too many people and too much things to realize, you know, I got to slow down and look at what I'm doing. Am I doing right? For man also knoweth not his time. We don't. We have no idea. When I preach in the streets, I tell them, you're going to die, but I don't know when. And I also believe that this is not only the time of death, but what he's talking about in the race, there may be a time to stop. We don't know when that's going to happen. Maybe a time for rest. We don't know what's going to happen. Maybe a time that God's going to put you in a hospital. Maybe the time you're going to go into the valley. Maybe it's time to go in the mountain. Maybe it's the time to offend. Maybe it's time for someone to get saved. Maybe it's the time to plant. Maybe it's the time to water. Maybe it's the time for... And we don't know when. Our whole entire race is different times. You know, I used to watch... I don't do it anymore. I used to watch the Boston Marathon, and I used to watch football. And it always had time. There's always some kind of clock running. 
And you didn't know if he was going to run the ball all the way down to, to the end field. You didn't know he was going to throw the ball and the team was going to, the other team was going to catch it. You didn't know he was going to he was going to get tackled in the play and maybe get injured. You don't know if the quarterback would be put back instead of going forward. And even the Boston Marathon, oh, oh, here comes the runners. It looks like they, and then the guy trips and falls. They had one Boston Marathon. It was this woman came up and she run the race in a ridiculous amount of time. And just shocked everybody. Wow, look at the clock. She, she won. And she started hiccuping. And, What happened was she came into the race later on, early. She didn't run the whole race. She cheated. There's a time of cheating. And in our Christian walk, there's a time. In my, in my life, there's a time that God's going to give me a job. Looks like it's coming up. There's a time I believe that God's going to find a woman for me to be my wife. There's a time for the plant, there's a time to water, and there's a time to increase. I don't do the increasing. And I've had times, including members of my family, who's gotten saved by God using me. There are times to put gospel tracts out. There's a time to preach the gospel loud. There's a time to sit with an open Bible with somebody. There's a time. There's a time to eat. There's a time to drink. There's a time to be married. Life is full of time. But we got to do what's proper in the proper time, and not for the devil, for the world, or self. As the fishes that are taken in an evil net. Now, evil is not sin. Evil is a consequence. For the fish, it's evil. It's a bad con. It's a bad consequence of the fish. Because what's going to happen to the fish? Many of those fish are going to end up in a plate to be eaten. Now, maybe some will be thrown back. Now, not fish. I grew up with lobster men. Now, let me tell you about lobsters. We had to gauge the lobsters, and the lobsters were too small. They went back. You had to put them back in the You only could keep lobsters so long. They had to be bigger than the rule. If they were smaller, they went back out. If it was a female and she had eggs, we were to put her back in the water. But if that lobster was not a female with eggs and it was, was big enough, well, he got caught in the evil lobster trap. What's the evil lobster trap? <laughs> we got lobsters. Somebody's going to have lobster tonight. Or when they buy it. And as the birds. That are caught in the snare. That's a trap. And in the times of Solomon. Where they sold the birds in the temple. That Jesus knocked the tables off. They would go out and catch pigeons and doves. So they could sell them. Because they were sacrificial. In the times of the sacrifices of the people. Or they would go out and set traps for quails and birds that they could eat. Their snare, their trap is, if they get caught, they're going to be offered for a sacrifice or they're going to be offered on a plate and be eaten. So are the sons of men. So men are likened to the birds and likened to the fish. Evolution takes it one step above. Men are like in the trees. Are snared in the evil time. There are snares. There are traps. And there are nets out there to catch. You've got to read Pilgrim's Progress. As I said right now, I, I am looking for a wife. One woman right now is responding. And I'm praying to the Lord. Is she of God or is she of the devil? I don't know yet. It's going to take a while. 
But if she's of the devil, that's going to be a trap and a snare. It's going to ruin my life. If it's of the Lord, then it'll be good. There are some people sometimes that come up to me at the, at the farmer's market and they'll shake my hand and there'll be money in it. I don't know until after they pull away. Oh, okay. Now, i got to be careful because when somebody comes up to me and outright offers me money in the open, because I have been accused of panhandling, which I don't, but I have been accused of panhandling at the farmer's market. So if I take money from somebody at the, at the farmer's market, they may be watching me. They may be trying to entrap me and say, look at that. He took money from me. He's panhandling. And Pilgrim's Progress will also give you snares and traps. That would be by the enemy. That would be by the world that hates you, the, the devil that, that, that frowns against you and trying to stop you. And yes, other Christians trying to deflate your ball of, of playing in the game to get you on the sideline and not do anything anymore for the Lord because they're not doing anything for the Lord. When it falleth suddenly upon them. You got to be careful. It, it, listen, when you come to a trap, it ain't going to say, here I am. When Bathsheba took off her clothes for David, she didn't have tattooed on your body. You're just gonna, I'm going to ruin your life. When Bathsheba took off her clothes, she had the body of a woman that David had no idea what the trouble she was going to cause. And when Solomon undressed the wives of the thousand wives he had, they did not have tattooed on their, on their, on their bosom, Baal. Asterisk. Christmas tree. Jeremiah. Chapter 10. That was extra. You didn't have to pay for that one. Your sins and the devil and the world and Christians are not going to have a big billboard. Hi, I'm a sign. I'm a, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a snare. I'm a trap. Sometimes it is. <laughs> Sometimes we sin a sin that we know is in the Bible, but that's our favorite sin, and we just avoid what the Bible says so we can do that sin. Man, that's not a trap. That, that, that's, that's foolishness. And I'm going to tell you right now, I cannot name your traps because I don't know what the devil's going to do to you. I don't know what the world's going to do to you. I don't know what Christians are going to do to you. I don't know what family's going to do to you. Everybody has their different tracks, but you got to read the Bible. You got to see what the traps were. Potiphar's wife was a trap to Joseph. Pilgrim's Progress will show you some tracks. Both a pilgrim and a faithful and a an hopeful and of Christina and her family. Biographies of saints of God will tell you about traps and will warn you of traps. When they set a bear trap to get a bear, it, it, it's not out in the open. It, it's got brush and trees and leaves and cover it with probably a big piece of meat. I don't know how they catch it. But we, we have mice in the house. And we got mouse traps. Those mice are stupid. We put cheese in there. They love cheese. They walk up to that thing and they try to take their cheese. Snap! They're dead. Why? Because they didn't recognize the trap. There are Christians out there, snap, their Christian life is dead. Why? Because they didn't see the trap. 
Then read and study their Bible. The Bible says, study, show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word. I didn't see that coming. It's probably in the Bible. Simon Peter's trap. Don't stand at a fire with the world, warming your hands with the world. You may want to deny him. When your wife comes up to you and says, dear, here's my handmaid. Go in on to her. That's be, uh, no, no, dear, you're my only one. Where do you get that? you got to read your Bible. And you got to be careful to try because even the devil puts three snares before God, Jesus Christ. If Satan tried to ensnare and trap Jesus, you think you're so proud and so wonderful in this that God's not going to attack you? I know of a 99% assurity in my life. The devil would not try to use beer to get my, he would trap me. I take a, a, a smith of beer and to me it smells like piss. That's a Bible word. Look it up. I smell beers like piss. Wow. Phew, get that stuff out of here. And there are things the devil will put out there. I'm not gonna tell I'm not gonna tell you. But I'll give you one little I walk by somebody smoking a cigar or a pipe. Uh, it smells good. <laughs> I just got trapped by the devil because I inhaled an extra of that aroma of a pipe or cigar. And I've been entrapped that it's in my lungs now. He got me. Listen, I'm a born again, Bible believing, evangelist, Christian, street preacher, gospel pastor, track around, old time Methodist belief, Baptist. And all the ways that the devil puts that snare in my eye. I believe how the devil puts that snare in my eye. Oh. Sometimes I'm like, oh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh, caught. Sometimes, whoa, no. I get caught many times. And many times, no, no, I see, okay, I see that trap. <laughs> Go over here. And sometimes I get up in the morning and say, Lord, I don't know where I'm going to go today. Lord, I'm going to, I'll be, as far as I know, I'm staying home all day today. What can I do? What can I type on Facebook for me, for you, Lord, is going to make somebody angry? Lord, I'm going to go, I got the doctor's appointment, or we got to go to Walmart, or we got to go somewhere. What can I do for you? And Lord, whatever the plans are today, or whether there are no plans today, the devil's out there. I'm going to walk, and he's got traps. He's got things out there. I need your help. And you know what? God is not going to go set all those traps off. I am not going to come up to that mousetrap. Oh, God slipped that mousetrap. Thanks for the cheese. No, that cheese is going to be in that mousetrap, and that mousetrap is going to be ready to spring. I'll walk up and say, God, that's a mousetrap. Oh, okay. Let me walk around it. And then this thing comes up. Ah! Oh, God, I got my foot in a bear trap. I put it out there for you. I, why didn't you see it? I wasn't paying attention. I took my eyes off you. I wasn't studying the word of God. But I put it there. They're there. And they're going to be there until your body dies. And as a Christian, you're absent from the body and present with the Lord. Temptations. Snares. Pitfalls, valleys. And don't think because you're so strong. Don't think because you're so wise. Don't think because you're running so quick. And running too quick may get you right into that track quicker.
This wisdom have I seen also under the sun, the theme of the book, and seen great unto me. All right, all right, here's another wisdom. 13 is a new paragraph going all the way down to the end of the book, end of the chapter. Here's another one. This is wisdom. There was a little city. Nothing big. And he doesn't even name it. Notice that? There's a little... Is it a Gentile city? Doesn't say. Is it a Jewish city? Doesn't say. Is it in the land of promise? It doesn't say. Is it in Africa? Doesn't say. Where is it? There was a little city. And a few men within it. <laughs> That's some city. It didn't have many population in it. You would think it'd be a town. But there was not many men in it. Not counting women. Not counting the children. But not many men in it. And there came a great king against it. Not just a king. A great king. Now remember. Why, you know, strong. Wise. Wonderful. I got a big letter on my chest. I don't know how to wear. I don't know where my underwear goes. But I got a big letter on my chest. A great king. And besieged it. He's attacked the city. He surrounded the city. Nothing comes in and nothing goes out. No food. No water. No ammunition. No mail. And built great bulwarks. And this is attacked the city. Against it. It's a military campaign against this little city. We don't know the names of the, of the people. We don't know the names of the city. But he's a great king. Now there was found in it, the city, a poor wise man. And his name? Come on, big history books and textbooks. We got to have the name. Don't you know the name of our church? Don't you know the name of our pastor? Don't you know the name of our president? Don't you know the name? Put it in stone. Make a statue. And he, the poor wise man. It doesn't even tell you he's old. I was going to name this thing the poor old wise man. I looked at it. It doesn't say he's old. It doesn't even say he's young, but he's broke. <laughs> and he's, he's wise and he's broke. There goes the prosperity gospel right there. <laughs> the guy's so wise, he's broke. He, by his wisdom, delivered the city. How? Not telling you. <laughs> this poor, wise man defeated a king and his entire army that was in the action of besieging and building a military against this city. And this poor, wise man defeated the armies and the king named... And this poor widow woman came up, cast two mites, her entire living, into the treasury. Name? Who were the deacons of the Corinthian church? Name? Who were the deacons of Timothy's church? Name? I have Apollos, I, I have Solus, Sol Sol I have this man, I have this one, I, I, name. You know, there are countless saints that are going to earn gold and silver and precious stones at the judgment seat of Christ. And the Bible says they're going to get a new name. 
The people in hell have no name. But you, Mr. Great, you, Mr. Wonderful, you and your in the land of the sea and blues. Man, there's going to be great people of the six church ages compared to the seventh church age of the Laodicean church age. And that includes Stiley Hayward in the Laodicean church age. Isn't your ministry great? No, it's not. Why? Because I think I'm rich. I think I'm great. I think I'm wonderful. God says to Stiley, you're poor, miserable, wretched, and naked, and blind. No, not yes. That's me. That's I am the lad to see in church aid that is spoken to me just as much as the next Christian today. And there are Christians out there today, and there are preachers and pastors and evangelists and mission. Oh, I, I am so great. I got one guy right now, Mom. He's so great. His name is on everything. It got to the point when we sat under him that his name, I got sick and tired of seeing his name. You may find out you're not as good as you think you were or I think you're going to find in glory any church aid. I think you're going to find the little widows that sat in the back of the church, sat unknown in the church, uncared for by the church. And you're going to find out those poor little widows are one that were the prayer warriors. And, there, and Jesus is going to say, come on up, ma'am. <laughs> wow, look at that. Five pieces of gold, ten pieces of silver, and three pearls. Wow. Well done, ma'am. Next, look at me. Look at my ministry. <laughs> All right, come on. Get the holy angels up there. You got to turn off the smoke detectors. <laughs> get the dust fan. Get the broom. Where's my rewards? I don't see any. Well, that woman over there. And no one knew her name. Yeah. Uh-huh. How about a preacher, pastor, elder, evangelist, missionary? I forget any. What if his name is so great or her name, you're twice as wrong? What if that name ends up to be checked in the book of life as they're cast off in the lake of fire and say, depart from me, you work of iniquity. I never knew you. But I'm... I was a pope. What? What's a pope? Gabriel, open the book. Yeah, look for the word pope. Wait a minute. Let me check the concordance. Come on, Gabriel. I want to make sure, God. I don't see no pope. What about what about this this Bible Baptist church? I don't see no Bible Baptist church in the in the Bible, sir. Your, your name may not be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Or we have a name here we don't even know. You know, there's going to be a lot of unknown named Christians at the judgment seat of Christ. And they're going to walk away with gold, silver, precious stones, and a well done. And you know what? I'm going to say it. I don't care no more. Oh, I do care. There are going to be many pastors and preachers and deacons in a church. That unknown person in that church, the pastor and the deacon, they were in our church? He was in our church? I don't remember who he was. Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah. How come you didn't recognize him? Uh -huh. Let's move on. So, yet no man remembered the same old poor man. This poor man 
delivered the city from a great king and an army. And who, who, who is he? You think I was full of it when I said, you know, church? Was he in our church? What does Solomon just say about that? He delivered the whole city. And nobody remembers who he is. Oh, they left our church? Oh, I didn't, even, didn't even notice. And every single church I've been in, there's been people. I'll go up to them. I'm not trying to get information because I pray for them. I say, Pastor, where's the joke? Don't tell me their story. Do you know about this person, this family? I had one pastor, he gave me the whole details. I, I don't want to, I just, listen, I'm praying for the family. I want to know, are they okay? Are they in the hospital? Are they, are they on the trip? Oh, well, you know, come to the thing. I don't, come, come to the thing, but I don't know what happened to them. When my wife and I left the church because of misunderstanding, of not explaining to my wife and I what church membership was. And he said, we're going to vote this family in. Listen, we've been in that church for, for a year or more. We're going to vote this family in because he was a favorite family, a click family. We're going to vote this family as a member. All those that who wants this family in this church, raise their hand. I raised my hand and the pastor looked at me right in front. You're not a member of this church. I, took my, I told my wife, Lisa, and I, okay, we're out here. We're not members. We're out. I had no idea what membership was. I thought, I was told when I became, uh, when I was saved, I became a member of Jesus Christ. I didn't know I became a member of Jesus Christ as salvation, and I had to be voted in by the church to be a member. I guess, you're, I guess if you're born twice, you're saved, and you're voted in twice, you're, you're in the body of Christ. Woe be to the, to the dying thief on the cross. Because he was never voted in as a member of a church. So he, he's in Baptist limbo. So anyway, my wife and left the church. The pastor called us out in front of the whole church saying, you're not members of this church. Okay, well, I'm not coming back. I, I don't know what you're talking about. You, so my wife said, well, we got to go to church. My son was going to be about born. I said, well, there's only one church, and she said, well, let's go ask him. And we went, we talked to the guy, and we explained everything, and, oh, I thought you guys just fell off the earth. On the, car, on the way home, I was telling my wife, we're going to church there, but I ain't part of that church. That guy didn't even care enough to come and figure out what the problem was. And listen, honestly, I didn't know we we had a it, the problem was ours, not his. He told. Me. I didn't know what membership was, and you told me I wasn't a member, so I left the church. Hey, I thought I was right, and we tried to find a King James Bible church, and we went about other churches, and I thought you fell off the earth. You mean you didn't go out for the one? You didn't try to seek to find out what you know. Was there a misgivings? Solomon said that nobody remembered the same poor man. That's sad. You know, that's hypocritical. I'm trying to think of another word. I, I can't. Uh, I'm trying to think of a word. That it's not coming to my head. They took advantage of this guy. They were not thankful. The city has, had the, the, the army has gone from this poor, wise man. There is no more threat. The food is back. And they didn't even think about the guy. I've been there and done that in many Baptist churches, my family. I've got a note in my Bible, one of the churches. Well, not that one. Uh, why is this pastor treating us as bastards? That's a, that's a Bible word, too. And I was out in public ministry. I was out serving the Lord. I heard many preachers, about, you've got a great zeal for the Lord, but we don't want to know who you are. I'm known by Jesus. My name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. Move on. So that was wisdom, verse 13. 
So on account of this, then said I, wisdom is better than strength. I am going to assume by that statement, I'm going to assume that this city had an army too. But Solomon said that wise, the wisdom of that man was better than the strength of an army. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised. And his words are not heard. Look at verse 15, right in the middle of the verse. He, by his wisdom, delivered the city. There was victory. And verse 16, nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised. He gave the city victory, and the people of the city can't talk to him. He's poor. He studies and reads the Bible too much. He goes out and screams at people on the street. He don't do things we do. He thinks he's a know-it-all. He thinks he's a holy roller. I can't think of the word, but what what is that word I'm trying to think about? They despise that man, and yet they he gave the city victory where their army couldn't, and the great king and his army are gone, and they were unthankful, and that's not the word I'm trying to think of. They were unthankful to this man. They despised that man. That is cruel. And Baptist churches are known for that. I have been on fire since the, since April 26th. I was saved April 25th, 1987. I have been on fire for the Lord, witnessing to the Lord. I'm going to tell you right now, I've got many silver dollar wounds in me. You say, what's a silver dollar wound? It's a butt wound where you got shot in the butt and I had not retreated. You get a silver dollar wound if you turn around and retreat from the from the battle, or you get it from your comrades in arms. I've got sword markings in my back. I have got arrow arrows sticking out of my back. I have been shot in the butt by Christians. As I try to go out there and win the loss and try to grow Christians, and they despise. And it happens in Baptist churches. The city despised the man. The church despised the servant of the Lord. One of Jesus' own disciples sold him out. One of Jesus' own disciples. I don't know who he is. I wasn't with him. No, not me. I wasn't with him. Absolutely not with him. And when Jesus is dying on the cross, only one disciple of the males, the females were there and Mary was there. Only one disciple out of 12 was at the cross of Jesus. None of the, none of the leprosy people, none of the lame people, none of the blind people, none of the deaf people, none of the maimed people, none of the, the dumb people. And yet, look at all those people he helped. And they despised and rejected him, Isaiah 53 says. And when you get a Christian that's on fire for the Lord, let me quote a man that got attacked by, by a Christian. Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Boy, I know what that I know what that verse is today. Marvel not, my brother, if the world hates you. All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Know not the world hated me first before before he hated you. And you know one of the biggest enemies you're going to have is other Christians. Dr. Ruckman said, and I'm not going to quote this completely, if I would have known what Christians were going to be like before I got saved, I would have never gotten saved. I know what you're talking about, Dr. Ruckman. 
And I back that statement up 100%. If I knew on April 25th what Christians would do to me in the 33 and a half years I've been serving the Lord, I might have said, you bunch of hypocrites, I'll go off to hell. That's a poor testimony. But the man, his own city, despised him. A man in his own church despises. Look at a great pastor we have. What a great church we have. What a great. Paul was despised and rejected. Then I said, I, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. Somebody had to hear those words because the king and his army took off. The city didn't even give the guy a hoopla. Woohoo! Hallelujah! No, it's him. How dare he, he do it? We're much better. We've known the pastor since then. We've been in this church since then. We sell more raffle tickets than huh? The Christian that has his armor on, buckled up, worn properly, that studies the word of God and tries to live right to God. Why is he in our church? He don't come to our fun activities. He don't come to movie night. He don't come to bowling night. He's the first one to tell us we're wrong. How dare he? Every single day he's saying something against Christmas. You believe that? Every day he's my Bill Bush. And it's, it's pagan and we like it. That Christian kicks us hard. Ow. Hey, Pastor, help us. That Christian over there is hurting our feelings. I know, I know, I know. The words of the wise men are heard and quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. You know, the wisest man of all, John said, you would need tracker trailers to record the works of Jesus. If, if everything was written about Jesus Christ, you would have to go to a state like Nebraska. And in the northwest corner of Nebraska, there is a red tracker trailer amongst 400 red tracker trailers, but it's got the number 5587. Go inside there and about three quarters of the way through on the pallet that's on the left side. On the back corner of that pallet, on about eight stacks high. All right, that's what we're going to read our text from. There are many things that were not recorded of Jesus. There are many times that Jesus went off all by himself to pray to the Father in secret. We don't know what those words are. And yet the Bible says that God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit pray for us now. And we don't even hear those words. You know what's gotten me out of many conflicts in my life? You know what's gotten me out of many snares in my life? You know where I've gotten the victory many times in my life? Those silent prayers of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Say, hey, Father, he's a sinner. Protect him. Father, he's a sinner. My blood has been shed for him. Father, he, he's getting in trouble. We, we got to get some angels. We got to do something for him. We got to protect him. And I never heard it. But me. I get that red light. Oh, not a red light. And Jesus is like, oh, that red light's to protect you, my son. When are you going to learn patience? If I would have given you a green light, you would have got into a multi-car accident. You would be in the hospital. Your life would be just ruined. But Jesus, I never heard you say that red light. I know you didn't hear me say that red light. That's faith.
that wise man, he became poor for my soul. He became poor for you. And he's rich in glory today. And he's praying for me. He's praying for the saints. And when he does something to help us, for me, a red light, I despise. I despise his prayer. I need to repent. I need to confess my sins. I need to learn patience. The whole world is a fool. The devil is a fool. But my God, my Savior is, is alive. And he's wise. He said, I'll, ne I, I'll never, I love you. I'll never forsake thee or leave thee. I won't give you anything you can't handle. I'll make a way for you to escape. And I make that way for you to escape. And you gripe and you complain. And you despise. Yeah, that's how we treat God. That's how we treat. Don't you tell me you don't. You're a liar. You appreciate everything that God's done for you, though it went against you. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. America's got the greatest army. You know, we got the we got the Marines. We got the Navy SEALs. Ta -da! But we don't have God. Babylon had the fortress. It had the great walls of Babylon. It had the strength. It had the power. And God says, just reroute the river. Yeah, the river there, just dig around it, get the water out of there, and go under. The Babylon army that destroyed Jerusalem in the temple. Where were they the night when the Medes and the Persians came in? Where was your military fortress? And yet Babylon was conquered overnight, Daniel tells us. America will be that way too. With your seals, your navy, your army. When God says, hey, that's it, I'm done with it. Ooh, you better watch out. But one sinner destroys much good. You know what the world says? One bad apple. The world says one bad apple. The app, they believe the apple was a fruit. We don't know it's an apple. So the church said, all are welcome. You bring one sinner to that church and be welcome. You're going to destroy your entire church. That's why we're in the land of seeing church aid. Bring the sinners in. Have them say a prayer. Don't say anything about salvation. Treat them right. Give them Mother's Day. Give them Father's Day. Give them a bail bush. Treat them right. We don't want them to leave. We want them to feel at home. The song is bring them in from the fields of sin. It doesn't say bring them in with their sin. Not once in the Bible, in the New Testament, did they bring sinners into the church. They went out to the sinners. Jesus says, go into the world and preach the gospel. He didn't tell them to bring them in the church. You start filling your church with sinners that don't repent, and then you wonder why things are a mess. Mega churches are filled with sinners and they're doing much terribleness, destroying 